Hello and welcome to the service of worship here at Westlake Hills Presbyterian Church. Here at WHPC, it is our mission to invite people into God's larger story as we follow Christ together. My name is Claire Berry. I'm an associate pastor here at the church, and it is my joy to wish you a Merry Christmas on behalf of the staff and session of this congregation. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship today, December 27th. There are a few things I'd like to draw your attention to today. First, if you have not made a pledge for 2021, or if you have yet to fulfill your pledge in 2020, now is the time to do so. Your year-end giving is very important so that the church can, f can finish out the year in financial strength. I also want to let you know that while our programming remains virtual at this time, there is still so much going on in the life of our congregation. Check out the website or use the church app if you want to find out more. And now, please join me in the call to worship. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Come and worship Christ, the newborn King. Please pray with me. God of grace and glory, we worship you today with all we have and are. We thank you for the gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love, each perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Make us ever more aware of these abundant blessings and your presence in our midst. Emmanuel, God with us, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. In John's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Friends, this peace has been born to us on Christmas day. I encourage you to experience and accept that peace and to share it with others. May the peace of Christ be with you.
As we turn now to the word of God, let us begin with prayer. Loving God with us, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us ears to hear and hearts to listen today. Open our minds to your wisdom and inspire us by your spirit that having received your word, we may live lives that reflect Christ and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading today is from Matthew's Gospel, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. Hear the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet and you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go! And search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Bethlehem, a child is born. Rumor has it, he's destined to be king. Now, as Christians, we recognize this as a message of very good news. But when King Herod first heard this rumor from the lips of foreign sages, it sounded like bad news. It sounded like Herod the king would soon be out of a job. And so he was frightened. Fear became Herod's sole operating principle. In fear, Herod called together an army of his own wise men, the religious authorities of his kingdom, to fact-check the foreigners. Now, getting more information, that's not a bad way to deal with anxiety. But for Herod, the more he found out about the Messiah, the more afraid he became, and the more he acted out of fear calling secret meetings, lying through his teeth, planning unthinkable violence. All of this Herod did because he was scared. The wise men from the east, they were not afraid. Ever since they first saw the star, they had felt irrationally excited. They'd been so stirred up that they set out on a road trip, taking the star as their only compass. Now, for me, this raises a lot of questions. How much about their journey could these wise men possibly have known or understood? How did they figure out the connection between this novel star and a foreign king? And why did they believe such a king would have anything to do with them? It doesn't make sense. But they just knew 
And when the star stopped over the place where Jesus was, their hearts were flooded by this wild joy. On quaking knees, they knelt down on the living room floor before the child and his mother. With trembling fingers, they opened their treasure chests. Yes, it was all so crazy. But the joy they felt affirmed that it was all exactly right. Matthew shows us these two responses to the birth of Jesus. He shows us Herod's fear and the wise men's joy. Fear would propel Herod down a very dark path. Despite the wise men's best attempts to foil the murderous king, his paranoia would reach its horrible conclusion. Matthew writes that when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under according to the time that he had learned from the wise men, that is, when the star had first appeared. There are few sentences in the Bible that bottle so much evil. But we all knew Herod was bad. Put it this way, I've never seen a Herod figurine in anybody's nativity scene. He's the villain, like Pharaoh or Pontius Pilate. Why even think of Herod? The wise men are right there with all their virtues, their courage and humility and faithfulness for days. And isn't their joy the point? Perhaps. But if we write Herod off too quickly, we lose the opportunity to learn anything from him. And I do think that's why he's here. I do think that's why Matthew has taken pains to tell Herod's side. You know, if I had been in Herod's place when the wise men first showed up, I'm not sure I would have acted much differently. The gospel of Jesus Christ is an unsettling message to receive. The power of Christ challenges earthly power, and not just state power, but your power and my power. Herod could see that, and he couldn't get excited about it. Can we? Like Herod, we want more power, not less. We like control. We are wary of change. We want certainty and for our own interests to be protected. This year especially, I don't feel much like following a star. Now that the presents are open, now that the traditions have been observed and the family Zoom calls are adjourned, I just want to hunker down. And I may not have a fortress like Herod's, but you could say, I'm well defended. You might say, I'm afraid. At Christmas, we affirm that God is here. But fear, it's here too. And it seems that this has always been the case. Once when I was a teenager, my parents woke me and my brothers up in the middle of the night. And their purpose was that we were all going to go watch a meteor shower. Now, actually, it was a meteor storm. It was the Leonids in 2001. You can look it up. But 2001 was an unusually high volume year for this annual astronomical event. So instead of just a few shooting stars every hour, it was thousands of shooting stars that would be visible in the darkest hours of a single November morning. Drowsy but excited, we bundled up, we piled in the car, and we drove out of town to a park that had these large ball fields where we could spread our blanket out and lie on our backs and watch the show. It helped that my parents had promised us fresh Krispy Kreme donuts on the way home, That really sweetened the deal for me. I'm not a morning person now, and I was 14. 
then. In all seriousness, I cannot describe to you what an extraordinary experience it was, how grateful I am to this day that my parents coaxed me out of bed that night. If you've ever seen a falling star, you know how easy they are to miss. The minute you see one, it's gone again. But on that night, if you missed one, it was because you were looking at 20 others. There was no need for us to poke one another and say, look, oh, there's one. No need for that. Beauty was all around us. We felt ourselves small in a big universe. And that was all right. It was good. In the little huddle of our family and in the crowd around us in the dark, there was joy. That night was so special, but it didn't change everything. Looking back, I would not call 2001 a good year. Freshman year was tricky for me with friend drama and awkward crushes and all the rest of those adolescent challenges. My grandmother was sick that fall, and she would pass away soon after that night. And of course, the national tragedy of September 11th was barely two months in the past. Still, when I think back on all the pain and grief and fear of that time, none of it dims the memory of that holy night. The story of Christmas reminds us that God's grace is overabundant. God's love is always spilling over from heaven into earth showing up in unlikely places from Bethlehem and Judea to Austin, Texas. What set the wise men apart from Herod all those many years ago was their openness to this reality of grace. They made themselves available to the great unknown. They were aware that their role might be small. Still, they knew their role was an important part of the whole story. Too easily we live without that awareness. We get locked into the fearful habits of Herod. We have, a, we have a habit of closing ranks. We have a habit of protecting ourselves with going just with what we know. And that is how, in fear, we make ourselves the very puffed-up center of a very small world. It doesn't have to be that way. There is still time. Recently, my husband Elijah and I were in rural New Mexico for a getaway. One night, as I was scrolling through my phone before bed, I saw that the Leonids were back, that meteor shower, and in fact, it was going to hit its peak that very night. I'll admit to you that I didn't get up right away. I was tired. It was already late and very cold outside, and it was only a normal year, a shower, not a storm. There might only be a few falling stars every hour if you managed to spot them. My eyelids drooped. But after a moment, I got up, and I put on every sweater in my suitcase and two pairs of socks, and I went to stand in the yard, craning my neck to get a full view. And I saw a few. It was definitely worth it. Wonder is a word that shows up a lot at Christmas time. 
If you shopped at Target for any of your Christmas decorations, you did that at their Wonder Shop. And we all sing along, it's the most wonderful time of the year, star of wonder, star of light. For many of us, wonder is just another Christmas word, overused, a little empty. But before this season passes, can I invite you to take wonder more seriously? I think this is where the wise men want to lead us. Wonder is the prerequisite to their joy. Wonder, attention to the bigger picture, even if it makes you small. The wise men's journey began when one of them simply looked up at the sky. Even in this time of pandemic, when there is so much to fear, so many possibilities that are closed off to us, we can still look up and see the stars. We can look into one another's eyes, even if we do so through a window or a screen. We can walk around the yard or the neighborhood, hear the birds, We can tell the stories of better times, the very best times, and know that their goodness is never really past and gone. We can choose wonder and choose joy because God is here and grace shines all around when we have eyes to see it. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, into our darkness, you have brought the light of your love, the wonder and joy of your presence. You have given to us a reminder of the many ways in which you care for us and guide us. And this has been a hectic time for so many of us. 
We have invested ourselves, our energies, and our resources in a flurry of activities. And now we are coming to the end of this calendar year with a new year in view, and oh God, we hope a better year. We wonder how are we going to have the energy that the new year will demand. Help us place our trust and our lives in your care. We ask for your care especially to be given to those who are hungry or cold today. We pray for the organizations that are working hard to care for those that live on the margins. And we lift up to you all of those that are caring for the sick, for the hospital staff, the assisted living staff, those who are caring for ill loved ones right in their own homes. Give them strength and courage for the times ahead. Let love be the foundation from which all our actions spring. Bless and keep us in your care. For we ask this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. to this day in peace, open your heart to the wonder and joy that God has made available to all of us in Christ. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.